stepping on. Despite the early time, because it turns out savings time, at least according to me, is mentioned to the history. Despite the early time, it is still a great time of our Lord. Amen. We have a couple of announcements this morning before we start. Sunday in Lent. We ask that you Sunday. Another quick one is in this week I will be offering communion, but Chris is leading us in our message next week. He'll be leading us in our message. I think that's actually all we have for announcements aside from we want to refer our there's to forward.com forward slash giving or text your follow the prompts and as always offering baskets for physical will be passed during the we have for this God we come before you thanking you for the ability to worship your holy name Father, so often it is that we take for granted that we get to be in your house praising you. And yet this morning, Father, that's a good to do. Father, this morning is spirit is through this place. We would meet your spirit where it's at. And in the process, may we not be up. May Father be praised. May we praise your name well this morning. With us this morning. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. We sing, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he up on that cross, he rose up from that grave. My God still stones away. The Lord today, we won't be quiet. Out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is here. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free.
every secret, every shame, every fear, every pain. We are, we are children of the day. So wake up, sleeper, lift your head. We are meant for shadows conquer death make the most of the time we have left we are the light of the world we are the city on a hill we are the light of the world and we gotta we gotta we gotta let the light shine we are the light of the world we are the city on a hill we are the light of the world and we gotta we gotta we gotta let the light shine Amen to that. You may be seated. At this time, little treasures dismissed. Kids, ages three, must be to five years old. You are dismissed for little treasures at this time. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Psalms, specifically Psalm 23, as we mentioned last week. It's a pretty familiar one that we're all we all know somewhat well. And today we're going to be through 3a so if you have your bible would you open them with me to psalm 23 i'm going to be reading verses 2 through 3a it says this he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside quiet waters he restores my soul let's bow before our lord in a time of prayer this morning father once again we come praising you holy name of the we come before you thanking you that we get the opportunity to do that. And already this morning, Father, we've sang songs of praise. We have witnessed your spirit at work. We would continue to join in your spirit. So, Father, as we open your book, as we read the words that you have for us, we ask that you would bless the mouth of the one who speaks our scripture, and you would open up all our hearts so we might hear your truth. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Friends and Jesus Christ, we join together through the power of the Holy Spirit this morning as we the Holy Name, continuing our series on Psalm 23. And as you're going to recall from Lent, we're in the season of Lent. The season of Lent being where we as Christ followers celebrate and remorn and remember the sacrifice of our Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross in a about four or five weeks on Easter Sunday. And throughout this entire season of Lent, we're looking at each verse of Psalm 23. Starting last week with verse 1 and studying how it's an analogy, right? 
It's an analogy written by King David that reminds us that God cares for us in all things. And this we're looking at the subsequent verses, verses 2 through 3a, and seeing how through this continuing example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ being the shepherd, He not only cares for us, but He sustains and strengthens us in difficult times. That's what we're going to be looking at today. And right as we start off in verse 2, King David begins this section after speaking in verse 1 of the shepherd caring for the sheep with what can almost be seen as somewhat contradictory imagery. Because he focuses in verse 2 on something that is very forceful at the same time that is very serene. And we start off with verse 23, verse 2a. With the forceful part. He makes me lie down in green pastures. King David starts off this verse with forceful imagery in that David says that he, the Lord being the shepherd, makes me lie down in green pastures. Green pastures. And I think that's important that he says he makes me lie down. And yes, I did check the Hebrew and it's, that's the exact same words that they use. He makes me, the shepherd makes me lie down in green pastures. Not the shepherd invites me to lie down. Not the shepherd offers me to lie down, but makes me, the sheep, lie down in green pastures. That's some rather forceful imagery. Well, why? Why would a shepherd sometimes need to force a sheep to lie down and rest? Well, as we said last week, sheep are actually pretty dumb animals. And as a dumb animal, sheep tend to not know what's best for them. So the shepherd had to make the sheep do things that they don't want to do, sometimes for their own good. Now there's a lot of people who work in livestock around here, right? How many of you know livestock? Raise your hand. So I remember when I was a kid. My grandpa owned a farm, and believe it or not, I actually loved agriculture till he sold the farm, and then turned out to not love it so much because, I mean, look at me. Do I look like a farmer? And so, a grandpa owned a farm, and I remember being about 9 or 10, and we're on, uh, we're on Harry. I called the International Harvester Tractor Harry. That was my name for it. So we're on Harry, and we jump off the tractor, and grandpa goes up to this young calf who's just standing there looking, you know, kind of blank at him. And Grandpa grabs it by the hind legs and jams its head into a trough of water and holds it there. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, he's got to learn to drink. I'm like, you'll drown him. And he said, no, he'll swallow eventually. And lo and behold, the thing started swallowing. And I'm like, that was incredible. He's like, yeah, they're animals. They're not smart. That's sometimes how you got to force them to drink. And here, David, using this imagery is saying about the sheep, sometimes the shepherd has to do the exact same thing because the sheep don't know what's good for them or even how to do things for their own benefit appropriately. Sometimes, in fact, often, the sheep don't really know what's best for them, so the shepherd would have to cause them to lie down and rest. But then we have to ask a question. How does the shepherd accomplish this? How does a shepherd accomplish making the sheep lie down to rest? Does he just sit on the sheep until they give in? Well, sometimes. Occasionally. But in fact, way more often than not, the shepherd back in that context would instead create an environment that the sheep would feel comfortable to lie down in. What do I mean by that? Well, According to one commentary I read, did you know that sheep in general will not feel comfortable? They won't feel comfortable enough to lie down anyway unless four conditions are met. According to a guy named W. Philip Keller, he says, the sheep will not lie down if they are afraid. And because they're social animals, they will not lie down if there is friction among the sheep. They will not lie down if there are flies or pests bothering them, and they will not lie down if they are anxious about food or water. And therefore, it was a shepherd's job to deal with all of that, 
to remove those barriers of rest for the sheep. In other words, a shepherd takes care of fear and friction and flies and famine, and in doing so, he creates an environment in. But after the verse, which is where are the sheep being promised to rest? Where has the shepherd brought them to? And of course, the answer is in our verse, in verse 2. He, being the shepherd, being God, makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. And this, even though the first part was forceful as far as making me lie down, this is where we get to the second half, the serene part of this passage. Because the area outlined in this analogy by King David is intended to evoke images of a place of peace and safety as provided by the shepherd. And how do we know that? Well, in the original Hebrew language that the passage was written in, David uses the word pasture intentionally as a place of rest. Now this pasture that he mentions in this passage, that can be seen as a bit different than what we imagine today is simply an open field where cattle graze. Because more often than not, a shepherd would not only have to find a place, but he would actually have to obtain a place. In other words, he would have to go up and work out an arrangement with a landowner for his sheep to feed on that specific area, if indeed it had a landowner. And on top of having to obtain that place and work out in the arrangement with the landowner for his flock, the pasture also had to have quite a few amenities for the flock. Because I don't know if you've been to the Middle East, but in the summer, it tends to get a little warm. In fact, it tends to get really, really warm. And you would have these sheep, huge with wool, walking around in about 115 degree desert heat. And so a shepherd would not only have to obtain an area that was good for him, he would have to obtain an area that was good for the sheep. Specifically, he would need shade in the summer so the sheep wouldn't overheat. And because sheep are such skittish creatures that we mentioned earlier, the place would also have to be safe from predators and believe it or not, sheep thieves, which was a real thing in that context. And so all of these things the shepherd provides for his sheep for the purpose of sustaining them. This is an awful lot of work for the shepherd. That's an awful lot of energy the shepherd puts towards his sheep. And David here says that the shepherd does all of this stuff, all of it, and because the shepherd does all of it, that's exactly what the Lord, the shepherd does for God's people. That's all the stuff that God does for His flock. That's what David says in these two ver this verse. But he's still not done. Because he makes a point to outline that this pasture, this place of rest, isn't merely any place of rest. But in fact, it's the best place of rest that the sheep could ever hope for. How does he do this? We know it again in verse 2 in the adjectives he uses. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Here David is not only showing us that the places of rest are peaceful pastures, but he's showing us that they are green pastures. In other words, pastures that are filled with young tender grass that the sheep can feed on and enjoy. I've never raised sheep in my life. In fact, now that I think about it, I think I've seen like a sheep in person like four times. But from what I understand after researching this, apparently sheep are also very picky. Which I can understand. Because I am also very picky when it comes to food. Sheep are very picky creatures. They do not like to eat old grass. They'll do it to survive. But they prefer the young tender grass. Because they're picky and it's delicious. Who knew that sheep were so uppity? But apparently they prefer the young, tender grass because it's easy for them to digest and it's the grass that the sheep like. 
And David says that that's the exact grass in this pasture that he's talking about. Not the old, hard-to-digest grass, but the new, delicious stuff that can really nourish us. And then he goes on to speak of the waters. And he says, it's like a calm, it's like a calm body of water. It's tranquil. This is not the raging waters of some rapids in the middle of a river, but instead, calm and tranquil waters that ripple so that the sheep can easily drink and be calm. And then we tie all of this together. When we tie all of what we have said up to this point, what we see here is that King David evokes a lot of imagery here in this verse. And in fact, he does this throughout the passage because he wants the reader to understand that the Lord God Almighty is the shepherd and we as God's people are the sheep. And just like the sheep mentioned in this passage, we too can often be picky. We too often don't know what is best for us. We too in the struggle of life often have difficulty lying down and resting. We too have trouble resting because our lives like the sheep are sometimes full of fear. We are scared at the world around us. We don't rest because like the sheep, our flock, our relationships may be full of friction. We feel we can't really rest because being the sheep we are, we are constantly being attacked and nagged by the flies of the devil, nagging us into the way of sin. And we fail to take the opportunity to rest because like the sheep, we are anxious about what the future holds for all of us. We are the sheep and we deal with all of those things. In all of these ways, we as God's children are exactly like the sheep in this passage. Which is exactly why it's so important to both remember and so comforting to acknowledge that even in the chaos and worry of life, our perfect Shepherd, Jesus Christ, has dealt with all of that removing all of the barriers so that we, as His people, may find rest. And how do we find this rest? By acknowledging that the same peace as found in this verse, this same peace that the sheep have in the pastures near the river, this same peace can and should be ours because our Shepherd, Jesus Christ, through His sacrifice on the cross, gave to us the gift that though everything else in our lives may be going wrong, He is the perfect shepherd caring for His sheep. He is the green pasture nourishing His people. He is the living water which sustains His children in their time of chaos. And by doing all this, Jesus Christ, our perfect shepherd, accomplishes everything He says that they would, He would do in this verse. Everything in our life may be going wrong, but we still have the Shepherd who gives us and leads us to peace. And though sometimes sustaining His children and strengthening His children, His sheep, means sometimes, yes, He pushes us towards something. More often than not, Christ sustains us by providing us with something. And that something is the fact that He, Jesus Christ, through His death, has removed those barriers of rest and instead invites us to rest in Him where we are strengthened and refreshed by His sacrifice alone. And what then happens when we embrace the truth of Christ being our rest? What happens to us when we celebrate the fact that the shepherd not only brings us to the place of rest in Him, but acts as our place of peace. So much so, that our, when our cares are given to Him, we are renewed. What happens to us when we celebrate and proclaim Christ as our sustainer? We find our answer in verse 3a. He restores my soul. Our souls are restored. And who does the restoration? Not me, not you. He, the shepherd, the Lord, restores our soul. And it should be noted that in the original Hebrew, the concept of a soul was a bit different than it is today. 
because the soul was more than just some ethereal perception of being. The soul was life. And so when David says our souls are restored, he's saying our lives are restored. And this place of restoration can mean that we're called to repent. It can mean that we're called to be remembering of Christ's sacrifice. Restoration means in the process we're made pure. In other words, what happens when we see that Christ is our sustainer? We as His sheep are called back to Him where we may be made pure and in the process we rest. That is what Christ accomplishes for us. That is what Jesus does as our shepherd. And I think this message is so important today, friends, because in this season of life, in this time in the world, in this time of our communities, in this time in our individual lives, where there is so much uncertainty, where we watch the news, whether it be CNN or Fox or BBC, and we see the chaos going on in the world. In this time where we may disagree with what is happening in our own country. In this time where there's still fears about war and sickness and death. In this world where there is so much uncertainty and anxiety and panic. Where there are many things in our lives that we simply cannot deal with anymore. Where so many of us are struggling with one way or another. It's so important to latch on to the truth of today. That whatever you are struggling with, Whatever is bringing you anxiety, whatever is causing chaos in your world, it is so important to remember that not only can, but we are invited to give it to the shepherd. Give your problems to Him. Cast those anxiety at the cross so that He may be praised and you may be refreshed and sustained on this journey of life. Because our shepherd, mine and yours, brought us Peace and wants to give us peace, not only because He cares for you, but because, because He loves you. In whatever you're going through, give it to Christ. And then, like the sheep by the amazing stream, we can be at peace. That is what Christ bought for us. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we become so familiar with Psalm 23 that we unfortunately lose the meaning in its words. And yet, Father, it is our hope that for these first two, two or three verses, that we as Your people not only realize and accept and celebrate the fact that You care, but we celebrate the fact that as our Good Shepherd, You lead us to these streams of peace. You died for us so that we might have eternal rest. And regardless of whatever is going wrong in our lives, we can bring it to You, Father, because You create for us a system where You want us to rest in You. So Father, we pray that as Your people, Your sheep, we pray that we as Your flock whatever is going on in our lives, we pray that we would give it to You and we would all rest in Your peace, in Your call. Father God, may we all have the comfort and knowledge that we are blessed to rest in Your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the chaos of our lives, Father, may we rest in Him. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And it is with this same heart. A heart of celebration and thankfulness. It is with the heart of joy that our perfect Shepherd, Jesus Christ, sustains us and gives us rest in our times of trouble. It is with this heart that when we embrace the fact that our Shepherd cares for us by sustaining us in Christ and granting us peace in all of our troubles, it is with this heart that we come to the table today through thanks. This 
with that heart that the Lord invites us into the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins. Because Jesus Christ not only died for the forgiveness of sins, but also conquered death to give us eternal life. And today in remembrance of this, in participation of this, we come before our mighty Father Father in heaven through the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Today we partake of this feast standing in awe of Him and the gifts and sacrifices that He has given us for His glory. Our Father loves each and every one of us to the extent that He gave His Son to turn us from enemies to children of Him. And our Father who loves us welcomes us today to this feast of the Lord. All of you who believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are invited to join in this meal because Christ invites all His people who trust in Him as their Savior to dine at His table where He will feed them with Himself by the Holy Spirit. So I invite you to come and receive all the benefits and blessing of His atoning death, His life-giving resurrection, and His ascended Lordship. By sharing the loaf and the cup, Christ makes us one with Him and with each other. And just as we're nourished by the food that we eat, Christ nourishes us spiritually at this table with the bread of heaven and the cup of salvation. Today we celebrate communion not only as an example and a reminder, but also as an invitation that our Shepherd, Jesus Christ, even in the midst of our troubles, gives us peace. He gives us peace in Him. And because these elements, they make up this joyful feast of the Lord, symbolize not just the flesh and blood of the crucified Lord, but also the life-giving flesh and blood. They symbolize the risen and ascended Lord. So as we celebrate today this Holy Communion, let's all take a moment and lift up our hearts and give thanks to the Lord our God in a time of prayer. Bow your head if you would with me. With joy we praise You, gracious Father. For You created heaven and earth. You made us in Your image. You keep covenant with us even when we fall back into sin. We give You thanks, Father, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who by His life and death and resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. For all these things, Father, we thank You. We thank You for Your sacrifice. We thank You for Your mercy. We thank You for Your grace. We thank You for caring for us as our shepherd, dying for our sins, which give us peace today. And Father, we thank You for Your love. Love that was given to us freely so that we may be made holy by the sacrifice of Your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross. For all these things, we praise You, Lord. And we thank You. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. We give thanks to God, our Father, that our Savior, Jesus Christ, before He suffered, gave us this memorial of His sacrifice until He comes again. At the Last Supper, the Lord Jesus, He took the bread. And when He gave thanks, He broke it. And He said, This is My body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. In the same way, after supper, He took the cup. And as He poured it, He said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. So whenever we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes again. Here at Living Water, if you are visiting with us, we're going to continue to do communion the way we've been doing it over the last couple of months. You'll see two stations here in the front. There's one here. There's one here. Both have trays of elements on them. I'll be over here with an elder. A couple of elders will be over there. For those of you who are gluten intolerant, we have a basket in the back. Uh, We ask that as you come forward for communion here in a little bit, that you come down the center aisle as we've been doing. 
Go to each individual station, whichever side you would like, where you'll be given a reminder of what Christ did for you. Take the bread, drink the cup. We ask that you consume it right there and then take the cup back with you as you exit down the side rows here in the worship center. For those of you who are worshiping with us at home, we believe that the grace of Christ transcends the elements. So whatever you have at home, whether it be bread, crackers, whether it be water, juice, milk, whatever you have on hand, take a moment, grab some elements so that you may participate with us in the Holy Communion in the Lord's Supper. And as we do so this morning, last week I encouraged you to remember that communion is a reminder of God's care for us. This week I encourage you to take communion as two things. Not only as a reminder and a reminder and a refresher of God's peace, but I encourage you to take communion and realize that through the Holy Communion it is a reminder and a way in which Christ sustains us even in the hardships of life. Because Jesus Christ is our shepherd. Our shepherd who gave us this to celebrate his death until he comes again. So, as you take this Holy Communion, as we partake of this sacrament, take, eat and drink, remember and believe that the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Elders, would you come forward at this time?
Friends in Jesus Christ, it has been a pleasure worshiping with you all this morning. I just want to name something real quick. In the life of the church, there are a lot of happenings. There are a lot of things that happen on a weekly basis, some of them great, some of them difficult. Uh, we want to acknowledge uh, Harlan and Connie's family in the loss of Connie's mom. We want to keep them in our prayers. We want to keep the Harrisons in our prayers during this difficult time in the loss of Kevin a week and a half ago. There are a bunch of people who are sick, who are in the hospital in this congregation right now. People are just struggling. People are scared about the world, and I understand all of that. But that's exactly why it's so important that we remember today's message. We remember the Scripture. Because everything may be going wrong in our lives, but we still have a Savior who wants to bring us peace. And so, whatever's going on in your life, I ask that in this week, if you're struggling, give it to Him because Jesus wants to give you rest. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything He has commanded us. And surely, He is with us always to the very end of the age. We have one more song. Amen. The chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, So the work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could, who could